Just a recap of the dream from last week's text, chapter 7. We're going to look at chapter 8 today, but um, this is the second vision of Daniel that we have. Um, and so a recap of the first one will be, um, Daniel has a, a dream of four beasts coming up out of the sea. Um, for Daniel's people, the sea was a kind of scary place. They, um, I'm sure I've told you this before, if you, if you look on a map at the coastline of Israel, where Daniel's from, it's this straight curve, well not straight curve, it's kind of an oxymoron, but it's, there's no natural harbours really, there's no places where you can um, really establish a seafaring culture there. Um, and so the sea was where the bad guys came from, um, not really uh, much of a benefit to them. So he sees these monsters coming out of the sea. The first one's like a lion and it's got wings. The second one is like a bear um, with either ribs or tusks in its mouth, uh, one of them longer than the other. The third one is like a leopard with four wings. And the fourth one is the most terrible one. And he doesn't actually compare it to any animal. But it is a beast and it's got teeth like iron and it tramples down those before it. Uh, no one can stop it. And this is kind of Daniel's version of Nebuchadnezzar, the king's dream. He dreamt of a big statue made of different materials, gold head, um, silver arms and chest, uh, bronze um, belly and thighs, um, feet made of iron, and, sorry, legs made of iron and feet made of iron mixed with clay. So Nebuchadnezzar, who's the king, dreams of a statue made of four different materials, or four ish. And um, but Daniel, who's the one who's not in charge who's not got all the power of the kingdom behind him, who knows what it's like to be beaten and knows what it's like to be the underdog, knows what it's like to suffer under kingdoms. He imagines beasts because that's how they uh, feel to him and his people. That's what they're like really. It's not just about the glorious statue, the glory of the kingdom. It's these kingdoms use violence and they, they beat other kingdoms and so they're scary things. So we're going to read today Daniel chapter 8, which is another vision of Daniel's. And so let's read that together. In the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, had a vision after the one that had already appeared to me. In my vision, I saw myself in the citadel of Susa, in the province of Elam, in the vision I was beside the Ulai Canal. I looked up and there before me was a ram with two horns, standing beside the canal and the horns were long. One of the horns was longer than the other, but grew up later. I watched the ram as it charged towards the west and the north and the south. No animal could stand against it and none could rescue from its power. It did as it pleased and became great. As I was thinking about this, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between its eyes came from the west, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. It came towards the two-horned ram I had seen standing beside the canal and charged at it in great rage. I saw it attack the ram furiously, striking the ram and shattering its two horns. The ram was powerless to stand against it. The goat knocked it to the ground and trampled on it, and none could rescue the ram from its power. The goat became very great, but at the height of its power the large horn was broken off, and in its place four prominent horns grew up towards the four winds of heaven. Out of one of them came another horn, which started small but grew in power to the south and to the east and towards the beautiful land. It grew until it reached the host of the heavens, and it threw some of the starry hosts down to the earth and trampled on them. It set itself up to be as great as the commander of the army of the Lord. It took away the daily sacrifice from the Lord, and his sanctuary was thrown down. Because of rebellion, the Lord's people and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. It prospered in everything it did, and truth was thrown to the ground. 
Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to him, How long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled? The vision concerning the daily sacrifice, the rebellion that causes desolation, the surrender of the sanctuary and the trampling underfoot of the Lord's people. He said to me, It will take 2,300 evenings and mornings. Then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. While I, Daniel, was watching the vision and trying to understand it, there before me stood one who looked like a man. And I heard a man's voice calling from the Ulai call, sorry, and I heard a man's voice from the Ulai calling, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of the vision. As he came near the place where I was standing, I was terrified and fell prostrate. Son of man, he said to me, understand that the vision concerns the times of the end. While he was speaking to me, I was in a deep sleep and my face was to the ground. Then he touched me and raised me to my feet. He said, I am going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath, because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. The shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between its eyes is the first king. The four horns that replace the one that was broken off represent four kingdoms that will emerge from this nation but will not have the same power. In the latter part of their reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, a fierce looking king, a master of intrigue, will arise. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper and he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, <coughs> he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. The vision of the evenings and mornings that has been given you is true, but seal up the vision for it concerns the distant future. I, Daniel, was worn out. I lay exhausted for several days. Then I got up and went about the king's business. I was appalled by the vision. It was beyond understanding. Amen. Let's pray now. <coughs> Lord, give us understanding not just to, to figure this out and think ourselves clever for seeing um, what this means, but to see and to hear, Lord, what you're saying to us today through this text, what you're saying for our lives today, and why this matters to us. Lord, we thank you that we can know you through your word, know you and know more about ourselves and why you made us and what it is you call us to. And so we pray that you'd help us to listen, that you give us wisdom and understanding and the power of your spirit, that you help us to trust in you. And Lord, please help me to speak the truth in love today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> so, it's another very strange dream, another one involving beasts, although it's more, it's a goat and a ram this time, and there's only two. So he kind of focuses in on um, two of those kingdoms mentioned or referred to in the, in the previous passage. But you see, like, it's still scary, it's still about violence and warfare. These beasts are not getting along. There's a lot of destruction and um, a lot of uh, trampling and attacking. It's a scary vision. And Daniel finds out that uh, what each one of these, um, these two beasts stands for. The first one he's told in verse 20, he's, he's actually given the interpretation by the angel. In verse 20, it's the Medes and the Persians. That's this. That's this um, ram with two horns, and one horn is longer than the other, and that represents the the kingdom 
that's really made up of two, two nations, two kingdoms, the Medes and the Persians, Media and Persia. Um, and the Medes were not as strong as the Persians, and the Persians became the dominant one, uh, the Persian Empire, the Persian Kingdom. And so that's why one horn is longer than the other, that's what that represents. Then after that, you see this, um, this goat with one horn on its head, and it just, it just flies, it attacks so fast its feet barely touch the ground, comes from the west and attacks and defeats the Persians, the Medes and the Persians. And that represents the, the Greeks, the king of the Greeks um, is the, the one horn. Horns are a symbol in the Bible of power, strength, military might. Um, so <clears throat> you have this ghost who attacks the, the ram. And the one horn on that is the king of the Greeks, who is Alexander the Great, who would come to power um, hundreds of years after Daniel. He would, he would just expand his, his kingdom so rapidly. By the time he was 32, he had expanded all the way to India. I think he died. Um, that's Alexander the Great. And nobody could stand against him. He was a brilliant uh, leader of his army. Um, and, but when he died, he had no natural heirs to take over. Um, well, there were none left. Um, so four of his generals took over. His kingdom, um, his empire, if you like, was split into four. And four of his generals. And so that's why you see that horns, uh, it goes from one horn to four horns. I just remind you that this was all Daniel's vision hundreds of years before the events took place. And so you have um, the Greek Empire split into four. So you have a, a, one was given to one uh, general, his name was Cassander, and he um, was in charge of Macedonia and Thrace. Then you have Lysimachus, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, he was in charge of Asia Minor. And then you have Seleucus, Syria and Mesopotamia. And you have Ptolemy, Egypt. And the two big ones out of that are the Seleucid Empire and the Ptolemaic Empire. Or Kingdom, I'm not sure if I should call it Kingdom or Empire. And so <clears throat> you have Ptolemy in Egypt and you have Seleucus, Seleucus in Syria and Mesopotamia. And in between those two, just imagine the microphone is the Holy Land. So Egypt's coming up and Ptolemy's, or, sorry, Ptolemy's coming up and Seleucus is coming down. And in the middle you have the people of God. You have um, Jerusalem, you have Judea. And so they get caught up in that. Seleucus eventually takes over. And the people suffer a lot under his reign, uh, under the reign of that kingdom. Particularly, <clears throat> one terrible king called Antiochus IV, or Antiochus Epiphanes, as he liked to call himself, because he had some idea of himself that he was divine. Um, so let me read uh, how he's represented in this text. Another horn coming out of uh, one of the horns, and that's Antiochus IV. It grew until it reached the host of the heavens, and it threw some of the starry hosts down to, to the earth and trampled on them. It set itself up to be as great as the commander of the army of the Lord. It took away the daily sacrifice from the Lord, and his sac sanctuary was thrown down because of rebellion. The Lord's people and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. It prospered in everything it did, and truth was thrown to the ground. So you read there that um, Antiochus, I cannot um, exaggerate how much of a bad guy this one was to the Jewish people. This horn grew until it reached the host of the heavens, and it says that. Um, <clears throat> And it threw down some of the starry hosts down to the earth and trampled on them. So there's some kind of spiritual warfare going on there. This is called apocalyptic literature, what we're reading now. It's not just the, the story of events that happened. It's apocalyptic. Apoc apocalyptic means um, a revealing. You see behind the scenes. So it's like the curtain has been lifted. And we see all the, the strange goings on behind the scenes and some events in the spiritual realm. 
So Antiochus um, waged a spiritual war as well as um, a physical war. And I'll get into some of the things he did. He um, forbade Jewish worship in Jerusalem. We were not allowed to, to make sacrifices to God. He erected a bust of Zeus in the temple. He, in fact, sacrificed a pig in the temple. He persecuted the people. He murdered the high priest. <clears throat> so it's described as the, the rebellion that causes desolation. We read verse 13. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to him, How long will it take? For the vision to be fulfilled. The vision concerning the daily sacrifice, the rebellion that causes desolation, the surrender of the sanctuary, and the trampling underfoot of the Lord's people. And this vision is so horrifying to Daniel that he was exhausted for several days afterwards. The vision chiefly concerns this bad guy, Antiochus IV, who would come hundreds of years after Daniel and terrorize the Jewish people, forbid worship of God, and instead uh, worship pagan gods in the temple and sacrifice a pig in the temple. This is a spiritual assault and a physical one too. Dark times, and it's a terrifying vision for Daniel. And, but we still live in a very messed up world, don't we? We still live in, you know, if you watch the news too much, it can scare you. We still see war and international tension. We still, we still see um, countries growing more and more powerful and not really caring about others. We see people dehumanized. We, um, we see people killed. And the church suffers. The church is made a victim. Worship of God is forbidden in some countries. We have brothers and sisters in North Korea who must worship in secret. <clears throat> so there is still this spiritual warfare going on. And we can't see behind the scenes all the details of it, but it is there. And even in our own lives, we, if, we, if we devote ourselves to following God and worshipping Him, we will experience times when there is spiritual warfare, when we feel particularly um, set upon by forces, when we feel that we struggle, that we're tempted, that we, we keep sinning, we keep giving in to temptation, we keep um, feeling distant from God because we've been pulled away from Him. And that is a spiritual warfare too. <clears throat> this vision that Daniel had and all of these visions really they come true in a period of time but they also give us um, a view of what will happen still we're still in the middle of this you know, the angel said that this concerns the times of the end we haven't ended yet so someone like Antiochus will come again Someone who will oppose worship, who will be arrogant, who will make a big deal of themselves and, and worship themselves and pretend to be God. Someone will come. Uh, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day, which is the, the return of Jesus, that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. So we're still in the middle of this, um, this thing, this spiritual warfare. But there is still hope in this text. I know it's a dark vision. I know it's a terrified Dan, but there is hope in this text. There is good news here. We see that the, 
the times of suffering are limited, that eventually that goat will be destroyed, but not by human power. We see that this, the sanctuary in the temple was reconsecrated eventually. Let me read verse 25. This is about that um, Antiochus Epiphany, that um, terrible king. He will cause deceit to prosper, and he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. In all of the scariness, in all of the suffering of life, and all of the things that might make us worry, we endure them, but we must remember that we endure them under the sovereignty of God, that these things happen under the sovereignty of God. When you suffer in your life, sometimes you suffer because of someone else's sin. Sometimes you suffer because of your own sin. Sometimes you're allowed to suffer as a way of disciplining you to, to bring you back to the right path. And sometimes you suffer and nobody knows why. And if we don't know, then we shouldn't say. But suffering can be used for our good and we can believe that because suffering occurs under the sovereignty of God. Paul wrote to the Romans, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. So all things can be used, even the scary things can be used for our good, because we were meant to be conformed to the image of Jesus. Our lives um, are not there so that we can, you know, we can be very rich or whatever. Our lives are there under the sovereignty of God and in Christ so that we can become like Jesus. We can become like Jesus. They're there to sanctify us, these things that happen to us, good or bad. God is watching over and God is with us and God is in charge so that we become like Jesus. And that will end in our glory. He also glorified ends with. The good news is that we have a God too who is no stranger to suffering, but he has endured it and triumphed over it. Jesus at the Last Supper, he said, I have told you these things. He's talking uh, to his apostles. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. This is just before he was crucified. He tells his disciples, take heart. I have overcome the world. And then as I um, open worship today, with the call to worship, Jesus said to his disciples after he came back, Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So in this world of bullies and, and victims and scariness, um, Jesus has taken for himself a people and he has saved them by paying the price that we owe for our sins saved us to repair us to change us so that we will be conformed to be like him and he is with us always to the very end of the age the good news is that yeah the end will come but for the Christian, this is not a scary time, this is a good thing. The end will come, but that means that Jesus will make all things new. So we go to the very end of the Bible and we read that other um, apocalyptic literature in the book of Revelation. A vision of Jesus. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. 
This is something we look forward to. The beasts will be done away with. The, the sea, we're told, will be no more. And that doesn't mean, you know, if you like the seaside, you need to, you know, that's bad news for you. It's the sea, that, the scary sea that the monsters come out of in Daniel's vision. There'll be no more of that. No more mourning, no more crying, no more tears, no more pain. Jesus will make all things new. Because the good news is that in all of this, Jesus is the one who's in, in charge. Jesus is the one who's in control. And so let that give you hope. Um, as we endure suffering, be it the things of everyday life or war and international tensions, which, you know, we live in a quiet part of the world, so thankfully we haven't had to, to put up with that. But Jesus is Lord over it all. And all things can be used for the good of those who love him. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that uh, we can come and we can read your word and we can ponder on it. And sometimes it can take a while to chew on and to, to sink in. But Lord, we learn, at least from this passage, that although there is um, forces in this world, there is none stronger than you. And you are in charge of it all. And so we pray, God, that you'd help us to trust in you. Even when we don't know why things are happening, Lord, to trust that you're with us, to trust that you care about our suffering, to trust that you care about us, and to trust that you mean to bless us, and to glorify us. We pray, God, that we would have that kind of faith in you that Daniel and his friends had, that we can serve you no matter what, and trust in you no matter what. Father, we thank you that uh, today we um, meet without as many restrictions. We pray, God, as the country opens up, that um, you continue to protect those who are vulnerable and that we would all continue to be mindful of them. That the numbers of um, seriously ill would continue to go down. We thank